a very good welcome to you today. Thank you for joining us for this broadcast. I'm Derek Bat. This is Dynamic Life Ministries, and this is our Sunday evening uh, apostolic impartation. And it's just such a pleasure and such a blessing to be in with you tonight. And may God bless you, touch you, and ever cause you to break free from the snare of the fowler, that God would break the snare and you and I would be set free by the power of God, the blood of the Lamb, the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So welcome tonight. Thank you. Please send us a message. Let us know where you're watching from. And please join us. Please share. Please say hello. And if, if you're blessed by this message, please will you share it on your Facebook and your social media platforms so that others who may not know or be affiliated or acquainted with our ministry may hear the word of God and be changed, transformed, and renewed, just like God is doing with all of us. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. We are continuing our series on breaking the holding patterns, breaking those things that have held us in bondage, those things that have made us miserable, sad, depressed, and all those things. We're going to break those things off our lives by the power of the Word of God. I want to tell you tonight, this Word, the sovereign constitution of heaven operated on this earth, the godly administration will set us free, break us out of the lie of the devil, the pit of the fowler. And I thank God for his word. I thank God for what he's doing in our lives and how he wants to just bless us and set us free. So let's pray. And then we're going to get right into it tonight. Good good evening, ladies. Thank you for joining us tonight. This, I want to say, this is a special message. And some of these things are going to really touch your life tonight and really help to set you free. So, man, I want you to just stay tuned. Take, take your notebook, listen. Let God speak with you. And I know God is going to do such an amazing thing. We've had some great meetings over this weekend from, from Friday, uh, Friday night, uh, early Saturday morning on broadcast with, with our brothers and sisters over in the United States. And then again on Saturday afternoon and then this morning in our service and tonight. And we're just so appreciative of what God is doing in the body of Christ. As we get ready for the new year, I want you to be understanding what the Spirit of God is doing, what the Spirit of God is preparing the bride, what God is preparing the ecclesia for. And that's a great, the a great awakening of, of the power of the Spirit of God across the nation. We will no longer want to walk and stay in that religious uh, mind, minefield or that religious trap, but God wants to set the church free. And all of these things that we're talking about in this series on... Uh, breaking the holding pattern this is all part of God's journey for our maturity so that we can be ready to walk in and do what God has called us to do at the proper time, at the appropriate time, not led by our own spirit, not led by our own flesh, but led by the spirit of God, led by the anointing of God. So it's just so good to be here tonight. Thank you so much. Let's get into the word of God and let's see the power of God set free in Jesus mighty name. Father, I thank you. Tonight, we just want to honor you, bless you. Thank you, Lord, for your word that comes to break bondage, to break the shackles of the devil, to destroy the lies that have held people in bondage for so long. And Father, let us take stock. Let us be wise and upstanding with wisdom, knowledge, and spiritual understanding, the things pertaining to the kingdom, that, Lord, you would come just to set us free. I pray, God, I thank you. I speak life of every person that listens to this message, those that would receive this tape or listen to the podcast or the YouTube channel. Lord, I pray that as they listen to this word, the power of God would just be touching their lives, that they would be open and receptive to receive and hear what the Spirit of God is saying. So, Father, thank you for this time tonight. We just want to honor you, bless you, and give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight we're continuing our series. This is part six. Thank you for watching the previous uh, episodes, and I trust that you, you can go back and watch them on our YouTube channel or just scroll back on our Facebook page and listen to them over and over again until they get into our spirit, man, until we're really touched by God in the things pertaining to the kingdom. And God really wants, to, wants us to understand the principality of the kingdom, God's territory. And part of that territory, folk, is you and me. Now, it's no good we're trying to go off and save the world and be evangelism, be evangelizing the whole world and going preaching in far-flung countries and all that. When our own temple, our own environment is all messed up by the things of the past. God wants to set us free. Now, I'm not saying don't go until you are totally free. You've got to go and do what God's called you to do. But I want you to be free. It's such a joy when we're free. It's such a joy when we're healed. 
You know, many times, if you talk to somebody that was suffering maybe for, for maybe 10, 15 years with back pain or knee injuries or something like that, that, that affects their mobility, when God touches them and he sets them free and they're pain free for the first time in many, many years, you can just see that expression, that overwhelming joy on their life for such a long time, they learned to live with that pain. They learned to compensate in that pain. But now, Jesus has come. The Holy Spirit has been to minister, to set them free and relieve them of that pain. Well, I want to tell you that joy, that wonderful riches of the kingdom of God is for us in our emotional healing as well. There's many people, you don't have physical pain. You're not, you're not immobile or immobilized because of physical pain. But emotional pain can immobilize you just the same. And physical pain and emotional pain, they're on the same level. The only difference is people may not see it. When you're walking in emotional pain, people may not see it. So we hide it a lot better because we think we can cope. But if those around us are spiritual and they're mature in the Lord, they will see that pain. And it's time that we were honest with each other. It's time that we, we were able to say, I'm in pain, I'm, I'm hurting, I, I need help in these areas. And that's what this series is all about, folk, is to bring us to the place where we can receive help and healing in the name of Jesus. So let's get in. And our topic tonight is what we learn, we emulate. Or what we learn, we repeat. What we see, we broadcast. Many times we are copiers of the things that we learn, the things that we see. And not all of that is bad, not all of that is negative. But many times, many of those things, especially in our, in our young days, in our informative years, when we were looking to adults to guide us and coach us and lead us, many of the things that we saw them do, we don't really want to do in our lives. But because we haven't been taught how to, how to change that and how to break that down and replace it with, with God's Word and the power of God, we end up just repeating that history and just doing the exact same thing. And it saddens me so often when I see a child become a young adult and they just start acting like their parents. And maybe their, their parents were, were, were just, you know, there, there was some ugliness in that marriage and that relationship. And then I see the kids get married to their individual wives or husbands, and I see they marry the exact same type of person. If it was, if it's a daughter, she marries the same type of man that her father is. If it's a, if it's a son, he marries the same type of person that his mom is, unless he understands the spiritual dimension of breaking those holding patterns and being free of those things. So we're going to talk tonight about what we see is what we repeat or what we emulate. Now, let's examine behaviors. Sometimes, you know, it's always good that we examine ourselves. The Bible says examine yourself. So we need, before anyone else does it, and sometimes people will do it with criticism, sometimes people will do it with, with, with a harsh attitude or a wrongful intent. So it's always good for you and I to first examine ourselves. Even the Bible says when we come to the table of the Lord to have communion, to break bread, it says first examine yourself. And if there be any issues and any sin, first go and put that right before you come to the altar. And I believe that principle applies here in the holding patterns. We need to examine ourselves. So when I look at examining, when I look at what God's trying to, what God wants to do with us, we need to say, you know, for instance, when somebody's always needy, they're always wanting somebody else to, to recognize them, you know, acknowledge them and appreciate them, all those things. They're needy. They got to, they're just in need of, of uh, somebody authenticating them. Somebody recognizes them. They're always looking for that attention. And when that is, I want to say one of the roots of that is that when they were young or growing up, they didn't receive the attention in a loving, caring manner. They might have received attention from the fact that they were always scolded, always told they were useless, always told they were no good. And so now they're looking for an exchange of that. They don't want that anymore. And all the way through the beginning of life, all, all the way through the informative years, an adult teenager or young teenage years and young adult years, they've been looking for affirmation. And so now when they're adults, they're still looking for that same affirmation. And because of that looking and seeking and desiring that affirmation, they always want somebody to say how well they did. And if that doesn't come, then they feel offended and used and abused. When Sometimes they're not used and abused. They're just looking for 
more attention than what it warrants. And so we need to deal with certain things like that. So that's why I'm saying we need to learn how to examine ourselves to, is this a real issue that somebody else is bringing into my life? Or is this something that's triggering what's already in my life? And if it's something that's already in my life, folk, we've got to do something to deal with it. We've got to fix that and come to a place where we say, Lord, that's not how I want it to be, and I need to change. And I bring it and I lay it down, submit it to the altar, and ask God to help us. You see, I want to say this. Here's some of the questions that I often uh, introspectively have a conversation with God. Normally, it's in a beautiful place where I'm maybe out in the bush or on a trail somewhere where I can just sit quietly. Maybe it's a park bench down there where, where we go and walk in, in, in our city. There's a beautiful park where we can go and walk and it's, it, you can just go and sit on a rock and nobody will bug you. And I sometimes just go and, and have that time of introspection. Sometimes it's just sitting in my office or sitting on the, on the, on the veranda and just saying, Lord, speak with me. See, we need to always have that ability to have dialogue with God. So the first thing I want to understand is from all the behaviors that I've witnessed, all the things that I've seen other people do. And we see, you see, if we're paying attention, we'll see a lot of things how not to do it. I remember quite a few years ago, somebody asked me, Derek, how many ministries, how many churches in, in that sense, how many services do you think you've preached in in the years you've been in ministry? And I said, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I've never kept score. I've never kept count. I don't know. It's probably quite a few. And the, the person who was interviewing me said, well, what did you learn? I said, well, you know, in some cases, I actually learned how not to do it. In some cases, I learned that what they were doing was well, and how could I use that and, and, and enhance on that in my own ministry, in my own life. But there were so many times when I had to say, I'm learning how not to do it. When I see pastors being harsh and brutal with the congregation, I'm learning how not to do it. And you see, we need to start asking our, 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 ourselves, when we've got a certain behavior, we've got a certain characteristic in our life, we need to ask ourselves, number one, from whom did we learn that? Where did that come from in our lives? See, in the systems of this world, in the religious system even, they'll say, well, I was born this way. No, you weren't. When we were born, we were born absolutely, perfectly innocent. We learned our behaviors from the time we were born. We learned everything we have in our lives today. We learned it since we were born. And some of them are good. Some of them are okay. But some of them are not so good. And others are just darn right ugly. And so we need to, the first question we need to ask ourselves, where did I learn that from? Why, what did I learn that makes me this way? You see, the minute we do that, we're now starting to look at the source or the origin of what it is that we've learned. And is it good? Is it acceptable? Or is it aligned to the will of God? Or is it actually out of line to the characteristics that God wants in my life? You see, now, when we start that question, that's not a condemnatory question to ourselves. It's asking for the origin of where did I learn this or from whom did I learn this behavior? Now, if I learned it from my parents, and many times we learn a lot of things from our parents or our immediate families, the uncles and aunts and, and maybe cousins and other fellow brothers and sisters that are older than us, we were learning all the time. We were like the sponge soaking everything in. The trouble was we weren't mature enough to process a lot of those things. So we just accepted them or listened to them or, or, or took them in at face value. And that's why I said what we learn, what we saw and learned, we just regurgitate or emulate without processing it. And now we're getting older. Now we want to start going back and redoing it and processing it. And now we're finding it a lot more difficult. But that's okay. Was I always like this? Question number two. Was I always like this or did something in my life happen that caused this change? Now, you know, when I, when I talk to people and, and folks, you got to understand, people are walking through things at different levels. People are walking through this out of different levels of maturity. People are walking through things out of different perspectives. 
For instance, if somebody loses a loved one at the hands of somebody else, in other words, it was a, a, an accidental death or a tragic death or even maybe a, a murder or something like that, that person, they were always loving and caring and, and acceptable of everybody. But now all of a sudden, they're suspicious of everybody and they hate Every, that type of population group or that people group. Why? Because they've just learned something out of a situation. So the question is, was I always like this? Or has something happened that's making my focus, my perspective change, and my character is being uh, uh, overtaken, and now my character, if I don't check that quick enough, my character will start to be altered. Now, as I said, the first question, where did it come from? It's not about us. You see, we didn't learn that purposefully. We didn't learn that. We didn't go out and say, you know, uh, well, I hope you didn't. If you did, we need to get you into some prayer group. But imagine waking up one morning and say, well, you know, this week, I'm going to go learn how to be bitter. I'm going to learn how to hate people. I'm going to learn how to be prejudicial. Nobody does that. I mean, those of a sound mind, a right mind, you don't do that. There's a certain people group that might want to do that, but that's not you tonight, see? That's why when I say these first questions are not to condemn, they're not condemnatory, they're exploratory. We're exploring where the foundations got laid by something that wasn't godly. And so if, if we start to understand that, we can start to appreciate that, we can quickly remove it by the grace of God and we can replace it with something better. But if we don't know where it came from, we're more likely to accept it or absorb it and then work around it. Especially if the world system says, well, you, he was born like that. No, we weren't. We were born innocent. We were born beautiful. The image, the, the very creation of God from the seed of a man in the womb of a, a woman grown and birthed and given birth, a perfect baby, innocent as the driven snow. But from that moment they were born, they are influenced by the world in which they are born into. Somebody born into a rich family and somebody born into a, a poor family. They're born at the same time, in the same, same place, at the same moment. They're equal at the start of that race. But one is influenced by the, by the affluence that they live in and the other one is influenced by the poverty they live in. When they get to 18, 19, they're going to be different in their outlook because of what the inputs were in their life growing up. Unless they've made Jesus Lord and they got rid of that stuff, man, they're on a separate path. And many of us, while we haven't realized it as explicitly as I'm saying tonight, we've been on a developmental path that's been taking us away from the characteristics of God that God wants to put in our lives, and we've been moved away by circumstance, situation, by emulation, etc. We've been moved away. And tonight, folk, it's time to say, Lord, help me. Let me come on back. Let me get back to where God wants me to be. So what... Where did this come from? Was I always like that? Or did something happen? Was there, was there some triggering event that caused me to change and start to have a different type of attitude? See, if my needs were overlooked in my past, and I'm going to go through life always wanting that affirmation because I'm still wanting somebody to come and bless me, meet my needs of affirmation and, and security and surety and confirmation and all those things. But when that doesn't happen, we're looking for love of people instead of the love of God. When I look at, unfortunately, some, some people uh, that get into all sorts of, of, of lifestyles that are just not of God. They're just, they're just anti uh, the kingdom and they're, they're just taking people away from God. They don't want to be like that. They don't want to act like that. They don't want to operate in that echelon. It's, but they're looking, if I take a, a, a young woman that's promiscuous and just giving herself to any man. She's wanting him to love her, even if it's just for a minute. And we know that's not love. That's just lust and all that thing. But in their heart, they think that's going to be love. They're loved. Somebody wants them. They feel valuable, even though they know in their, in their mind that that's not the value they're looking for. But at that moment, they're feeling that somebody wants them. And you see, you, we've got to get to a place where we show them the love of God, that God loves them. God doesn't want to use them. God doesn't want to 
just override them uh, and just use and abuse. So you see all these things come out of, out of where we've been focused, what we've been seeing, and now what we repeat or what we emulate. And we've got to be in the place where we say, Lord, I only want out of the throne room of God. See, people that live in that dynamic where they, they, they value, they don't value themselves. They don't like what they see. They don't like the way they act. The problem, folk, we got to do that from a, from a position of perspective, not a position of judgment. Because when we start judging ourselves, we say, I'm not worthy. I'm useless. I'm, I, you know, why does God even love me? I'm sure many of you tonight that are listening to this broadcast session, you've been there where you've said, God doesn't love me. Well, how could God even love me? And we start devaluing and abandoning ourselves. You know, when I look, we, have you ever heard this expression? Well, you know, that guy or that woman, they just let themselves go. They've got no more, uh, when I say pride, I'm talking about in a good sense, not in an arrogant sense. They've got no more pride in the way they look. They don't wash their hair. They're wearing, their clothes are dirty. and, and all that. They've, got, they've given up on themselves. They've actually abandoned themselves. And the reason they've abandoned themselves is because they, they, they think, wrongly so, but they think God doesn't love them and God's abandoned them. Many times people will abandon us. Folk, I want to tell you, I don't, I don't want to give you false hope tonight. But many times people will abandon us, not because they, they want to deliberately sometimes, but it's because they're dealing with their own issues and they don't have time. They don't have the, the, the EQ and the spiritual maturity to, to deal with their issues and try and help you deal with yours. So what do they do? They abandon you to look after themselves. And that's a knee-jerk reaction. That's just a, a negative statement. It's the same as if you look in business. A business that's sponsoring a whole lot of people and giving their, their money, they'll do that and they'll be a blessing to you. And then one day they realize they're in financial trouble in, the, in that company. Excuse me. They're in financial trouble. Then they write a letter to, and uh, sorry, we're right now we're not in a position to continue sponsoring this program. We have to curtail. We have to stop our sponsorship. Why? Because they're having to say, I'm shutting down external giving so that I can concentrate on the company. And many people in their own lives do the exact same thing. Why? Because that's what they've seen in the corporate world. That's what they've been involved in in the secular business community. And so now they start to act like that in their own life. And they say, wow, I'm going to have to shut that down. I can't give to those people. I'm, you know, and it's done sometimes. And, and listen, sometimes it's not wrong. Don't, don't always think everything that I'm saying here is all of a negative. It's about building boundaries and recognizing where did that come from? Is it something that I learned in my early life that I replicated or is it something that I'm now doing because another situation happened in my life and I'm having to compensate because of that situation. And you see, when we can start making those two clear distinctions and we can make the third distinction, am I doing this because I want something? Whether it's recognition, whether it's attention, whether it's whatever, if I'm doing it because I want something, we're building the wrong foundation. That's a holding pattern that's going to get us into the track. That's a holding pattern that's going to put us in the hole and get us in the mud because we can't sustain that. You know, you probably have, I've had some people around me that they just keep draining. They just keep on draining you. And the day that you just haven't got enough in, him, in your own emotional tank anymore, you're probably going to turn and be a little harsh with them, maybe even bite their head off a little bit. Why? Because you yourself are so drained. You just can't give them any more that day. And so you just put up a shutter. Now, you see, we've got to recognize what happened in my life that caused me to be so drained that I'm now acting differently. And I've got to recognize that, break that, and correct that in the spirit and emotionally before it becomes and establishes itself as a pattern in my life. And if it becomes a pattern in my life, we're in trouble because it's not how God wants us to be. Now, there are days and short seasons where we need coping mechanisms. 
There's times when I'm tired because I've been doing broadcasts and, and some of the broadcasts because of the time zone differences around the world. I'm getting up, you know, I go to sleep at maybe 10, 11 o'clock at night, my time, and then I'm up again just after midnight to be live on a broadcast with some other ministries or pastors at 1 a.m. in the morning. And that goes through to maybe 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And then I'm into my prayer closet and I'm in my own um, devotional time from 4 to 6. And then I'm out doing what I do through the day. And then at 7 o'clock that night, which means I haven't had but two, three hours the night before. Now I'm into this, the next night and I'm doing broadcasts and I'm counseling and I'm speaking and I'm teaching. And then I get a little bit of sleep. And then the next night I'm, I'm teaching, I'm counseling, I'm, I'm preaching. Man, and you can do that for two or three weeks and then you feel physically tired. Then I've got to pull aside and rest a while. Just like Jesus said, come aside and rest a while. And then when I shut that down and I say, guys, I can't do those meetings. And I, and I, and I try and manage my, my schedule. I try and manage my diary. Then I cut these blocks out of my diary where I just go to ground. Maybe go away into the bush because I love being in the wilderness. Go away with my wife and we just go camp somewhere or, or go to a cottage and just hike somewhere in the bush and, and just love each other and just spend some quality time with each other. It's because I'm recharging. And I know and guys, I can tell you right now, I love you. But there's times when I have to say to you, I can't deal with that right now because I myself need to go away and recharge. And I have to recognize that and I have to have people around me. And I thank God I've got people around me that recognize that. And so when I'm not looking as fresh and as sprightly as I should be looking, they'll say to me, hey, Derek, I think you need to get away a bit and go and have a rest. You've been burning the candle, as it were, on both sides. And so I thank God for those who, who hold me accountable to always be kind and considerate and righteous. So we've got to get to that place where we recognize what the circumstance coming into our lives, it, what is it doing to us? Is it changing us for the negative? And if we don't deal with those, they become patterns. Again, if I look in the secular environment in the system, I hear uh, especially some men that are workaholics or even some women that are workaholics. Well, you know, I'm doing this for my family. I'm spending all this time at the office, late nights, every night. I'm doing this for the family. No, I'm not going to question your motive, but what I can tell you, it forms a pattern. And that pattern is you're never at home. That pattern is that you're not actually there for the children. You can provide for them all the gifts and the goodies and the toys. You can take, get them away on holidays once a year. But the rest of the year, you're an absent parent. And you see, it becomes a pattern. It becomes a pattern. And those are the things that we need to break. So we need to be real honest tonight, folk. We need to get to a place where we realize the honesty that God has. We need to be looking at the patterns in our life. What caused them? What triggered them? Are they good patterns? Are they godly patterns? And if they're not good patterns and godly patterns, then we've got to say another two questions. Number one, is this pattern, how is this pattern hurting me? How is this pattern taking me away from the calling and the grace of God on my life and the character that God is trying to build and mature in my life? How is this thing, how is this pattern that's being established taking me away? How is this hurting me? The second question we've got to ask is exactly the same, but this time it's focused on others. The way I'm behaving, the way I'm acting, the way I'm doing these things, how is that hurting other people? And you see, if we're being hurt or we're hurting other people, I can tell you that's not a godly pattern. It doesn't matter what the motive was. It doesn't matter what, the, what we think the outcome is going to be. If that pattern that we are doing is hurting us or hurting other people, then that's not a godly pattern. Now, there's a time of sacrifice. There's a time of surrender. There's a time of laying down my needs, my desires, my wants to help and serve others in the body of Christ. That's not what I'm talking about tonight. That's a good thing. But when that pattern starts to hurt us, when I'm so busy running around with everybody else and I'm not getting enough sleep and I'm becoming irritated, I'm becoming, my health is starting to suffer and I'm starting to get headaches or whatever and I'm starting not to feel good and I have no energy in my life, whatever I'm doing, that pattern is hurting my physical health. Maybe 
what, I, what I'm involved in and uh, because I haven't set proper boundaries and people are overflowing into those boundaries and corrupting that, I'm feeling used and I'm feeling angry and I'm, I'm emotionally upset and I'm in turmoil. You see, that's not good for me, so I've got to break that pattern. Similarly, we can't be selfish where we say, well, that's okay for me. And if it hurts somebody else, tough luck. See, that's also wrong because God called us to love one another. So these patterns that we have, are they hurting us or are they hurting other people? If they're hurting us and hurting other people, they're not a pattern from God and we need to change it. And we need to be raw, honest with ourselves to say, Lord, I realize this, what this pattern is, is not good for me or it's not good for others. Maybe it's not good for me and others. Then we need to say, it's my goal, Lord. It's my desire to get rid of this, surrender it to you, bring it before you. Lord, it's my desire to break this thing, get rid of it and get healed of it so that I can change and be different. Amen. You see, being nice is a funny word. Be nice to people. I believe we should be nice to people. But you know, there's times when people are nice at their own expense. We used to have a, a people that were part of our ministry years ago. They would always come around lunchtime. Always pop in. They were, they, they'd left the, the ministry and they'd gone to another town. So if they come back to the city, they would always come and pop in around lunchtime. Expecting us to put a meal on the table for them. Now, I'm a nice guy. I'm always going to help and be hospitable. But I realized that was a pattern that they were creating that was manipulation. So one day I said to them, I said, you know, it would be great. Let's go out to lunch. I think, I think you can buy us lunch today. All of a sudden they said, no, well, you know, we just dropped, dropped in for a quick cup of coffee. We can't stay. But every other visit they stayed while we fed them. This time, because I said, let's go to a restaurant or let's go grab a bite to eat in town, and you're paying, all of a sudden they can't stay and they're having coffee. You know, I never saw them again. They never came to visit me again. You see, sometimes being nice is a good thing, but it's not the God thing because we're allowing people to manipulate us. And so we've got to learn, we've got to have the discernment of spirit. Being kind and being considerate is a godly thing. It's a gift of God. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. But it's not to the sense of abuse because that sets up a pattern that that pattern will hurt us and cause harm to us. Or maybe, even worse, harm to our family. You see, we, we, we mustn't be so giving to everybody else that we neglect our own family. That's a wrong pattern. We can joke and say, oh, you know, somebody can say, oh, isn't he a good guy? He's always there to help me and always, always available. Yeah, maybe I am. But if I'm doing that at the expense of my own family, then I can tell you for sure that it's wrong. And we need to learn how to get that balance from God. Not, not balance of a little bit of this and a little bit of that and two hours here and two hours there. It's not a straight curve. We've got to ask God, what is the balance in these things? Praise God. Amen. You see, we've got to come to that place where we realize that we need to build ourselves and others emotionally, intellectually, physically, and more important, spiritually. And it always needs to have those four elements to be practical and be useful for God. And if there's anything in a pattern in our lives that doesn't boost one of those four, then there's something wrong with that pattern. That's the way I, I look at it. That's the way I can discern it. Is it building me emotionally? Is it building me intelligently, intellectually? Is it building me physically? Is it building me spiritually? If it's not, then it's not a good pattern. And similarly, when I look at other people around me, is this going to build them emotionally? Is it going to build them intellectually? Is it going to build them physically and help them with something physical? Is it going to build them spiritual, spiritually? If it's not going to do one of those things or more of those things, it's not a good pattern. If it's going to harm one of those four, then I know that I know that I know that it's not a godly pattern. I don't, you know, some, some things are a little borderline, but when it's going to hurt them in those four areas, I know for a fact it's not a godly pattern and I need to break it. See, so that's how we start to identify these patterns in our lives. They come from our past. They come from what we learned because what we learn, we will, we will regurgitate, we'll emulate, we'll copy. Are those patterns good for us? Are they good for other people? If they're not, 
we need to change them and submit them to God. You see, when we start asking those questions and we start going even deeper emotionally and spiritually with God, we start to ask, in what areas of my life am I suffering right now? In what area of my life do I not have victory? How, Lord, can I change it? What are the patterns that are causing this not to be healed? Here's a practical example. Say, say you're standing there barefoot and you walk into a, to a place where there's just a whole lot of thorns. You know, there's a little burning feeling on the bottom of your feet. You're standing in the thorns. And you go, ouch, ouch, ouch. And you sort of hop a little bit and you grab hold of something and lift up the foot and you start taking those little thorns, especially those little paper thorns. Man, they sting. Now, you know you're in the thorns. Wouldn't it really be not so clever if you pull out the thorns and then just keep walking into the thorns with your bare foot? See, we've got to ask ourselves, if we're in that situation, what is it that got me into this thing. And if I know what got me into this thing, I won't continue in it because I'm going to continue with the same pain. So we've got to stop and do something differently. How does this make me feel? Make me feel good? Make me feel encouraged? Make me feel uplifted? Or does this make me feel down and negative? Does it change my focus on life? Then I've got to stop doing that. Stop focusing on that and change my gaze. Fix my gaze somewhere else. Because that's just the negative in my life. That's just going to cause me hurt and pain that God doesn't want me to have. Then we've got to ask ourselves, what, what could be blocking us from changing it? See, if we know we walked into the thorns or we know there's a, there's a pattern in my life that's not good for me and not good for the other people, then we've got to say, what's stopping me changing it? And this is where, again, we've got to have this on, honest conversation. Many times, you see, because of past, and we won't, we've been in there in session three and session four about the way things of our past hinder us and hold us back. You know, some people like being a victim because they need the attention. They want the, they want the recognition of people giving them attention. Oh, shame. Sorry. Sorry you're going through this. How do we, how do we just love on you? Now, they'll love on you to get you out of it, not love on you to keep you in it so you can just get more and more attention on the same thing. But you see, many people want to stay a victim. Don't stay a victim. Is there the will to change? Is there the desire to stop this repetition of this cycle in our lives and say, Lord, enough. What am I doing? Lord, what is it? that's hindering me from breaking free? What is it that's keeping me in this holding pattern going round and round and round? Let God show you, let God speak to counsel, let God bring you wisdom from others even if, and, and, and understand what it is and then desire more to break free than stay in it. You see, until, we, until our desire for change is greater than the desire to stay, we're not going to change. If I take marriage for a moment, it's always a difficult subject. It's a sensitive subject, so please forgive me. Somebody's in a bad marriage. And for years, you're staying hoping that your spouse will one day miraculously just change. Now, unless God has said to you, they're going to change, there comes a day where you're being, they're beating you. They're abusing you physically. They're abusing you emotionally. They're starving you of emotional uh, love and care. They're starving you of finances. They're keeping you poor and, and in desperate place. And when they're angry, they, you, they're punching bag. You've got to get to a place. I, do I want to stay in this or not? And sometimes we need to say it's time and ring the bell and say, that's it, I'm done. And God understands that. And we've got to be ready. Do we want to stay in that holding pattern? But some, you see, some like to be the victim. Don't be a victim. Don't get comfortable being a victim. Let's find out. What does this make me feel? Does this make me feel good? Does this make me feel cherished? If God was physically present with me right now, 
and he saw the way people were treating me, would he be acceptable of that treatment or would he speak up? And if God speaks up that it's not acceptable, then you know that pattern is wrong for your life. We need people that will speak up and speak into our lives so that we get to that place where we know the will of God for our lives. What's blocking me from the change? And you know, guys, I want to tell you with all honesty, that's the hardest one to, to call on, on, on a situation. What's hindering me? What's keeping me in this mess? See, then we can get into all sorts of things, the fear of the unknown, the fear of change. The world system has got the saying, better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. Well, I want to tell you, it's no good to know either devil. Amen? The one you know or the one you don't know. It's no good to be with them anyway. You need to get free of that. But you see, that's how the world has conditioned us. That's that psychological mumbo-jumbo rubbish that tries to keep you in bound bondage and keep you bound. Well, it's better the devil you know. I mean, I remember sitting with a, with a lady one day counseling her and her husband was abusive and, and he would beat her up, especially after a, a, a little bit of overconsumption of alcohol and what have you. And, and he'd have his friends over and he'd belittle his wife in front of them and make fun of her and, and be, you know, really ugly and smutty and all that in front of her. And man, it wasn't building her up as a woman. And I said, to her, why do you allow that? Why? What trade-off? Are you allowing to keep that behavior? He said, well, when he feels guilty, he buys me nice things. Or when, he, when he's feeling sorry, he'll take me to a nice restaurant. We'll have a beautiful meal. And you see, I was shocked in that sense. I can't get my head around. You'll suffer all that abuse just to have a nice meal. The, her trade-off is he spoils me with gifts and presents, but because he does that, he can abuse me and use me as a punching bag and a verbal uh, attack and belittle me in front of his friends, but it's okay because I'm going to get a nice gift. You see, I'm not going to judge that action or that motive. What I can tell you is that woman was not loved and didn't, when she was growing up, she never probably had the love of a father the love of all the people around her to make her feel special, make her feel cherished. Now she said, that's my lot in life. That's what I've been assigned. I can't change it. And folks, I want to tell you tonight, no matter what you're in, no matter where you've come from, no matter what your circumstance, God can change it. But God wants to partner with us, see, so that he changes it with us. He doesn't force himself. He doesn't impose his will on us. He gives us the free choice to accept him and walk with him. And when we want to change it, we come to God as a partner and say, God, I'm ready to change this. I'm ready to lay all this down. And whatever you say, Lord, I'll do it. God will stop bringing the change in our lives. And yes, it may not be a comfortable journey. It may not be an easy journey. But if we'll take that journey, God will get us out of that pit, get us out of that miry clay, and he'll put us on the king's highway. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We need to know how to do this. We need to know how. You see, otherwise we stay a victim. And we have this trade-off. What are we going to get in return? We've got to be careful of that, church. Where did this come from? Is it good for me? Did it come from my family? Did it come from my past? Is it something I learned? Also, you know, in this day and age where we have television and a lot of movies and, and, and channels, uh, streaming channels, movies on demand, you know, a lot of that is just pumping into families on a television screen. Such negative perception, portraying things that are not real. Many people, young, young people, especially the girls, they watch these soapies. And you know, some of those soapies, this, the woman in the soapy, she's sleeping with this man and this man and this man, having an affair with that one and this one and that one. What is she learning when she's watching that, that soapy? She's learning that behavior, and what she sees, she starts to copy and emulate because she wants to be like that. Man, it's going to mess her up. Boys, 
watching movies where, where the gangsters are the thugs and they, they get their own way by beating people up and being arrogant and, and being, uh, uh, you know, challenging authority and, and, and being the rebel and, and being the respected gang leader and everyone's in the in the neighborhoods looking up to them. They start to want to, they watch that on a TV screen and now they want to go out and live that in the world and they start, what they've seen, they start to emulate and start a copy in the world. Man, as parents, we've got to be so, so attuned to what we allow our children to watch. And if it's not a godly value system, we need to say no. Or if they do watch something and in that, in while they're watching that movie or that, that series and there's something on there that's not morally correct or it's not biblically sound, we need to be there to say, hey, you know, you watch that on TV, you saw that guy going around murdering people, that guy going around a hitting woman and abusing woman. Hey, I just want to tell you, that's not God's plan. That's not God's purpose. When my, when my boys were growing up, when they were young teenagers and middle-aged teenagers, and they would go out, and they were old enough now to go out and go to, go to the events they were going to, I would always stay up, not to check them and sit at the door with a watch, but I would always sit up and wait for them to come home. And when they'd come home, even if they were dog-tired, they knew the rules. The rules were you sit down with dad downstairs in the lounge or we sit in the, in the kitchen, we have a cup of coffee. And the rule was this. Tell me what did you learn tonight? What did you see tonight? Is there anything you want to ask me about that confused you? That's not in line with what I've taught you. And especially my older boy, as he got older, he started to ask me questions. Dad, I saw this. And they, they were acting like this. And, you know, I, I, I really didn't like it. And then I'd explain to him why he didn't like it, because his spirit man was not witnessing with that. And I was there to immediately give alignment and proper understanding. See, if we don't do that as parents, you know what's going to happen? Tomorrow they're going to go to school or they're going to go to college or wherever. They're going to start asking their peers, their friends, this was bugging me last night. What do you think of it? Now they're opening themselves up to all sorts of interpretations. Maybe they, they're Christian children. Maybe they're not Christian children. Maybe they're also burnt and hurt. And now you're getting this mess of counseling. But when they come and ask dad, dad's going to give them righteous counsel. And even if they ask two or three other people to, to clarify what I've said, they'll, they're going to get somebody and they, or they'll get somebody that says to them something different. They'll say, no, that doesn't gel with my spirit. See, we've got to teach people, especially in their young age, how to discern by the Spirit of God and not just by emotions. Amen? We've got to know how making a change will benefit us. How will making a change benefit others? So we realize, we've said earlier, one of the questions is, what is this doing that's hurting me or hurting others? Now when we talk about change, we've got to ask the same question, but from a different emphasis. How will this benefit me? How will this benefit others? Because you see, if you don't see the benefit in it, it's going to be hard to do it. If you tell me I want you to go to gym, bless gym. And I go to gym and for the first couple of weeks I'm training my heart out, but I'm not seeing any results. I'm going to start to say, well, what is this all about? This, is, this ain't working for me. This ain't working. And be willing to quit a lot easier than if I see results. What's the benefit in it for me? What's the benefit in it for other people? I'm not talking about that from a sense of pride or arrogance. But we've got to know what's the benefit. And one of the first benefits we need to be able to say categorically and know in our hearts, know in our spirit, the first benefit for me is that I draw closer to God and I'm more like his son and I can give him glory. My dad will be happy. My dad will be pleased with what I'm doing. That's why I'm making this change. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing so that my daddy, my God can be happy and blessed with what I'm doing. That's a good enough motivation. The rest will come as a bonus. But if I can have that as a motivation, that's always going to take me through. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's what God wants for our lives, church. What, is, what does this benefit God? What does this benefit me if I'm going to make this change? And if we go back to the previous question, we can ask it in the same way. If, I'm, if what I'm doing, is it going to be a benefit to God or a blessing to God? Or is it going to bring dishonor to me as a son of God? Is it going to bring dishonor to the Father? 
And it was going to bring dishonor to the Father. It's a pattern I shouldn't be creating. It's something I shouldn't be doing. But if I'm doing something that brings honor to God, I know that's a good thing. Balance with not being uh, self-sacrificing and not, not hurting other people. See, then I know that I'm doing it for a right motive. I'm doing it for the right heart. I'm not just doing it to be seen, not doing it to be recognized. I'm doing it because it's going to bring God the glory. Hallelujah. How much of a new vision do we need in certain areas of our lives? How do we get to the place where we start to realize what God is saying instead of just doing what we're doing? Are we aware of the healing that God wants to do in that area? See, if we don't know where we're going, we can't ever take the journey. Otherwise, we're just wandering around the wilderness. So when we understand these things, when we identify these things, that God wants me to change because it's hurting me or it's hurting people or there's no benefit and glory to God, then we've got to set a plan in place. How do we change? How far do we change that it brings glory to God and it blesses me and it helps other people? It blesses other people. Know the vision. The Bible says, know the vision, write it down, make it, cl- make it plain, cast the vision so that people can run with it and attain it. We've got to know where this is going. We can't just change for the sake of change. And that's what happens in a lot of people's lives. They don't like something, so they make a change. But they don't realize that all they're doing is swapping that change for another change that's not good. I want to say it like this. If you're in debt and you've got a credit card that you've maxed out and somebody else offers you a new credit card, now you start spending on that credit card. You just swap one problem for another. And many times people do that in our lives. We just swap one situation for another. But we're not fixing it. We're not changing it. We're just isolating ourselves from this problem and going and getting involved in the next problem. That's not change, folk. That's just multiplication of problems. So we've got to get out of that. Are we mindful to protect ourselves in the Lord and protect others around us? Are we mindful of that protection? So praise God. I'm going to stop there for tonight. It's, we're almost on the top of the hour. I pray that this session has blessed you. There's so much here. We could spend three sessions just on this topic or this section of the of this teaching, this series, just on its own. But there's so many nuggets. I want to say if you've got issues that, that, that I've spoken about tonight that's triggered in your life, please inbox me privately. Uh, I mean, if you want to do it publicly, I'll answer you. But uh, if you want to just do it privately that I can talk with you and share with you and counsel you, I'd love to. Because I want to see you set free. God's heart and desire is to see you free. Amen. So I want to say tonight, let's get to the place where we're being influenced to change, to give God the glory, then stay in the pattern that brings hurt to us and hurt to other people. Thank you so much for being part of this broadcast. Thank you for sharing. If this broadcast has touched you, if this broadcast has ministered to you, please, I ask you, Share this on your wall to, so others can get the benefit. Take the Facebook link, take our YouTube link, and share those links so that other people that you know can subscribe and be part of what God is doing in this ministry or through this ministry. Because I want it to help them. I want it to bless them. So please partner with us. I'm not asking for your financial contributions. I do thank those who do supply and, and financially bless this ministry and sow into this ministry. But I'm asking you for a different partnership. I'm asking you to partner with us to get the word out. Partner with us to help people out of their miry clay. Help people by exposing them to words and teachings like this that will break the holding patterns in their life and allow God to set them free. Father, thank you tonight for this word. I pray, God, that you will just bless us. Every ear that is heard, let us have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Let us allow this word, Father, to fall into our hearts into good ground, that it may flow and blow. Bl- flourish and blossom and bring forth a harvest in our lives thank you father god for what you're doing in our lives the grace the love the goodness of god upon us you didn't come to condemn us you came to love us and to save us and to set us free i pray lord for that freedom and salvation tonight in the areas of emotional healing in jesus name we bless you we give you glory now amen so god bless you thank you so much for being with us i'll be back on tuesday night with another series uh That's our Tuesday night message, the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, talking all about the truth of the kingdom of God. Please come and join us for that meeting. It'll be great. 
It'll be good to have you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming and spending some time with me. Thank you for inviting me to, to speak and minister into your life. I love you and I appreciate you. May you have a beautiful, beautiful evening further. God bless.